hardly a topic for laughing at. G'day, folks. Welcome to today's show. Uh, we have a great guest today, as I get to talk about drums, which is a very uh, interesting subject to me. So we have Lucius Boric, who's a great friend of mine, who's also the son of the famous Australian blues guitarist Kevin Boric, which I'm sure you'll uh, he'll fill you in on the details of that today as we go through his musical history and our history together. So please welcome to the show, Mr. Lucius Boric. Hey, hey, Steve, how are you? <laughs> Thanks for having me. How are you, man? I'm excellent. I'm excellent. That's and, right. Uh, well, I'm here in my... Yeah. This is this is our first go at doing a podcast. Everyone's doing a podcast, so I thought, right, let's see if I can do a podcast. So I thought, well, let's talk to people who are in stuff that I'm interested in, comedy, bands, but especially in Australia, guys who are in kind of big bands but aren't big to the rest of the world because Australia has its own scene with our tyranny yeah. of distance and our isolation and our massive land mass and our low population. And as you know, being in the music industry for 30 odd years, it's, it's, it's not a, a, a bedrock of, 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 of success environment being in Australia. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. There's a big underground scene. That's for sure. 100%. So tell us about, as for people who don't know uh, who you are or even who I am, I am a, a comedian who you also used to play in bands, so I'm very interested in, in music and drumming, especially as I play drums. So tell us about your history. As Lucius, by the way, is, is probably one of Australia's premier best drummers, easily, even better than me. And uh, Ooh, I don't know about that. <laughs> is there a thing called better or is it just different? Yeah, uh, no, there is a thing called better. Well, I, I would, I would definitely put that tag on the Buddy Rich if that was. I definitely think he's better than everybody. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> Sorry out there if I offended anyone, but yeah. he's like a magician for me. I watch him and I get, I'm like, you know, spell. I don't know how he does it. His timing is just like impeccable. I think it, whatever he's thinking of, what, from what you're watching and perceiving, he's like accurately playing it out and actually you know accomplishing it and putting it on the he's just a, you know and right up until he was you know i guess 70 something blah 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 it was just unbelievable well he was Amazing. still he was he was giving neil peart lessons right okay when neil peart was in his 50s or something yeah i think he um he did a a, a show and it was going so hard and you can see when he plays, he's like so hunched over and his sweat's just dripping. He's got that smile on his face. He's so focused. It's just like, you know, meditation, zen, you know, some martial arts kind of approach to playing drums. And then, um, you know, and he's just absolutely ripping, just going for it. And I think after that show, he had to go to the hospital because he had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> and, then he, and, then he, and then he came back the next day and played on stage. I think he did a show like straight after. So... It's because musicians are special people. Especially drummers, Steve. Especially drummers. They mock us all the time. But 100%. But anyway, tell us about your history growing up as the son of uh, Kevin Burridge, one of Australia's premier uh, lead guitarists, uh, lead guitarists, blues guitarists from the uh, from the 70s, 80s. Yeah, a bit of everything really kind of, um, from what I understand, it was kind of the end of the 60s uh, through the 70s. He had quite a, a good career, the 80s. Um, and he's still going. He's um, he's like 70, 74, 75, maybe seventy six. Uh, so yeah, blues player. Um, he wasn't around much, you know. He was he was really, I guess, trapped in that archetype: sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and creating all the collateral damage he could behind him. But you know, spearing ahead as being like a a, uh, a kind of blues rock legend, which is kind of how he's perceived in in some of the Australian music scene. So. You know, he wasn't around much, um, but there was, you know, my uncle's uh, Doug Parkinson, who's a, who was a soul singer. He passed away like three years ago, unfortunately, but he was our a soul he, singer. So he's, he's married to my mum's, um, he was married to my mum's sister. So he's your uncle, Doug Parkinson. He, he's my uncle. Yeah. Dear Prudence. He did a, a thing, a, a song there, like a famous Beatles song. So in focus, I think his band was called. So I spent a lot of time as a youngster around uh, him. Um, and also, obviously, you know, when my, when I'd see my dad, um, there was always music, musicians, uh, and, um, yeah, I, I kind of got amongst it pretty early, um, 
the drummers in my dad's band found it quite amusing when my mum and dad were actually together at one point when I was really young. Uh, they made a drum kit. They made a tiny little drum kit for me out of bongos and little cut cymbals for hi-hats. I was three years of age. Uh, apparently, I could play 4-4 four, four time. Um, and, yeah, there's photos of me at that point playing. I can see that. So it, it was a true thing. And, but the tape, they, they actually did, um, you know, put it down on a cassette tape, but that got lost, you know, me, me kind of playing or whatever. But that would have been cool to have. But, um, yeah, it kind of kicked off from there. And, um, you know, it's been kind of music and, and drumming ever since, really. Well, if you're going to start at three, three. That means by the time you were 16, you've been playing drums for 13 years. I I got a drum, at a drum kit at 16. Yeah. yeah. Well, as we were discussing one day, because you've come in into music basically being a, a musician all throughout your childhood, whereas I've come into – it was good I got into the music I got into because the music I got into being thrash metal was, was made to sort of, you know, out of punk – and was made by people who couldn't play when they started. Yep. Which is a different sort of uh, – uh, it's a different experience musically in the sense of – because it was like it was like a form of music being created, thrash metal, and so and it was being created by – but like the Americans could always play a little better than the Europeans at, at that point because you had Metallicas and Anthrax and Slayers, and they could already kind of play their instruments, whereas the guys that came out of Germany, Sodom, Destruction, Creator, was more feral. Mm. So it was made by guys who were pushing the limits mm. of their absolute abilities, which was not much. Yeah, but, right. But, so but, but, but that attitude of just wanting to play fast and savage – so, so I, I I came into music. So, so my musical uh, uh, landscape really is 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 purely from feel. So, so not based around much technique. Yeah, or or maybe people like parents around you or family around you, like I had. So it was a different type of environment. Oh yeah, well, you know, you, you know, it's even if it come from a muso family, you're lucky to get a drum kit any time. Yeah, you know, well, I didn't, I didn't, I, I didn't actually get a drum kit until I was like eleven or twelve. So, because I, I had that little mini kit, but that was made, that got stolen, that got lost, and then from the period of like, say, like four or five to, you know, I guess eleven, twelve, I didn't really have a drum kit. So it was, you know, I'd go and play on the kit at school. There was a drum. I remember there was a drum kit at school, which was busted up and wasn't very good, but I could hit things. Um, you know, it was grabbing chopsticks and pillows and, you know, the side of my bed and, you know, just drumsticks on the floor and just, you know, air drumming and, you know, whatever I could do to mimic and play. But I did get a drum kit um, when I was about 12 and it was a premiere. Got that for Christmas. My father actually bought me that, which was, which was nice. Uh, didn't have a snare drum. Oh, the main one you hit, so that was a bit. That was a bit of a, that was a bit of a bummer. Uh, yeah, so, so I did a lot of tom playing yeah. <laughs> to start with. So, um, but yeah, whenever I could, I'd kind of set that up, and and I I have got a pretty cool story with um, how I got my first snare drum, which was my I went to the studio where Cold Chisel was recording one of their albums, and um, it might have been East or something like that. And I went into the, you know, the, the drum room, Steve Press, which was there, great drummer, great songwriter, and um, sitting behind his kit. And he's like, oh, okay, nice to meet you. Hi, Lucius. Oh, you drummer? You play drums? Yeah, yeah I've got a drum kit. But I haven't got a snare drum. And he said, no snare drum. So like, that's the main one you hit. And I was like, I'm like, what do I do? And he, he went, wait a minute. And he turned around and he had like five or six snares on the ground and he just reached up and he goes, well, there you go. He gave me this beautiful, um, 14 by 5 Ludwig snare drum, which became, you know, I play that snare drum all the time. I'm, I'm still playing it. So, the, best, the best part of your whole kit? It's the, Yeah. Well, the premiere kit, funnily enough, was was from a drummer, a great Australian drummer called John Watson, who played with like, um, oh, geez, he played with um, Australian Crawl, uh, Renee Geyer. He played with my father, many, you know, big session drummer. 
amazing drummer, left-handed, but it was his drum kit. So it was a premier kind of that classic oyster pearl wrap of the of a kit. Um, so yeah, once I got the Ludwig, that was it. Made a couple of cymbals, and um, yeah, it was on. My first kit was a pearl export. I had one of those too. Had a white kind of, one. They were kind of a white one. I had a white pearl export as well. White pearl export. Okay, I think it was. I think it was six hundred and fifty bucks. Yeah, yeah, nice. I had to pay that off from the old. Because yeah. I started, I started too with the. Uh, I started with the with the. We had a. When I was a kid. I had a, sh- a plastic shoe rack. It had put your shoes on like this, and had these yeah. plastic plastic bars, and I pulled them out. And went Genius. right here. Genius. We go. Genius. And get the, get get the pillow on the side of the bed for the high hat. The mattress will be the snare drum. I mean, I've got two ice cream buckets, and put them there, leaning up against them. We put gaff tape on the lids or something. Right. And I just sat there to the radio, going like this. Yeah. Until I met Mick Burke, who I ended up forming Slaughter Lord with at school, and he he could actually he could play guitar way better than I could play drums when we started. <clears throat> so I, I used to play along with the radio, and then just sat there and me and Mick Burke. Well, I learned half of National Acrobat, which is the second track off Sabbath Bloody Sabbath by Black Sabbath. Nice. And the next door neighbor had a spare room, and we set the stuff up in there, and I. I'd play half a national acrobat until I got to the fast bit and I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, that's how that's how I became and Mick. That's how I became in, in, into music. And uh, I was never like, as you said, you, you knew all these guys from these Aussie bands. I was never really into Aussie music except uh, certain songs, like early angel songs. Right. Yes, yeah, I saw the Angels when I was really young. I remember going to a gig because I was, I got the opportunity, obviously, you know, go to a few gigs because my dad would, would play and sometimes I'd, I'd go, if I really want to come along, I would really want to hang out with you. Um, so I'd go to some of these gigs. Sometimes I'd even go on tour. And I remember there was an Angels gig and I met, I just remember, the, you know, the guitarist with the glasses um, who, who, who just stood there. He didn't yeah, move, he was always, he was always didn't, great. Didn't move a muscle. Except for his fingers, and he's yeah. and he's on the fretboard, and I used to just go, "How the, how's he doing that?" Like the other guys were going crazy. I was, I was, I must have been like fourteen or something. Um, but yeah, really high potent density gigs with you know people sweating. Well, he was a he, he was a he was a Brewster, yeah, one of the Brewster brothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I remember him. He was very intriguing as a kid because he was, uh, yeah, he was like a robot. Yeah, it was like a, like a robot. Because I did like, see him on tele- I did see him on television, and then when I went to the gig, I was like, "Fuck, he's like he's doing the same thing right now, exactly the same as what he did on the television." He was it's like, he, it's it's like he was like Oz Pub Rock Craftwork. Oh, yeah, you know, you know Craftwork. Yeah, 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 exactly. yeah, great. And who great drummed band. in the Angels? Uh, well, they had a few drummers. They had a few drummers, I think. Um, Buzz. Buzz Bistrip was one, I'm sure. Buzz Bistrip, great drummer. Um, yeah, I can't really remember maybe some of the early guys or the later ones because um, I, I wasn't the biggest fan. I had a, I had a really good friend at school whose brother was a huge fan and I, I kind of got into them as well through through that. I just like the yeah. singles. You know, I was, yeah, I yeah just, the singles were great. Was, I just used to hear the radio then. Uh, what's it? Take a Long Line is great and uh, Shadow yeah. Boxer. Yeah, all those ones. All that stuff's great. But yeah. I was never into, to be honest, I was just never really into Aussie music. Yeah, I was. I kind of was. I, yeah, yeah, quite, yeah. I didn't, I didn't. A, I liked just a couple of songs from bands when I was young, watching the music shows. And and the only band I really got, I liked the first Flowers album, Ice House. Yeah, great band. Great songs, great, great album, that. And the only Aussie band I really got into was uh, a certain ACDC songs, of course, growing up. Of course, yeah. Which I didn't know till I read an ACDC book that those clips that we would have seen when we were kids on the TV, ACDC, that, that, that no one in the world was watching those clips. And I just figured that if you're on telly, you must be famous in the world. Sure. But I didn't realise that they were just Aussie releases then. 
No one had really heard of him doing jailbreak and all those clips. And it's only, it's a long way to the top and rock and roll and all this stuff. And so, so I yeah, like I that you, stuff. I and I like, the, you get into the oils at all? That I'm about to say. Yeah, I got in. Well, because, you know, Rob. It's the only was, band I fully got into. Yeah, yeah. Well, I got really, because, you know, obviously he had that kind of Keith Moon swagger, you know, like in showmanship to some degree. And so I really got into the oils big time. Mate, I got into bit on all big time. In fact, watching mm -hmm. one of your video clips the other day from Cog, because uh, we'll go through your bands in a minute, but I was watching one of the clips from Cog the other day. I think I wrote it down because because the the, the yeah, it was a bird of a feather. Yeah. So I wrote it down here because the way you're hitting those drums, it's got it's I wrote it, it's got Rob Hurst <laughs> volume and power. <laughs> that that Australian thing where you just like oh, yeah. Smash. Well, well, my drum my drum kit became a bit of an ode to certain drummers too. You know, like the way I configured my kit and stuff like. That. And the, I've I've got a gong that I've always had in the background with cog on my kit, which is like a twenty two inch kind of gong wind gong, and that's an ode to Rob Hurst, really. You know, it, it really is. Um, the 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 Roto Tom that I've got, that's an, a note to kind of like Bill Bruford, yeah, um, Terry Bozio and some of those kind of players and Pink Floyd with that, you know, great time theme in the in Dark Side of the Moon album with the Roto Toms. Um, yeah, so you know, and the the splash symbols I've got too are more Stuart Copeland esque, you know, like a bit of an eye to him and here so we go. Here we then, go. And then, and then, yeah, and then the drum kit, you know, before you bring in all the other toms, is set up kind of similar to Buddy Rich. I try to, you know, yeah. And right. I've, you know, I've interchanged kick drums for the twenty four to give a bit of that bottom sound, and sometimes I go back to the, you know, twenty two by fourteen, you know, which is a bit more sharp and punchy. So I've had a lot of fun, kind of, you know, when I sit behind the kit. A lot of those guys really, you know, taught me a lot, and I, oh, I, gained, a, I gained a lot from you know, just so many different drummers and my drum kit's a bit of a, a mishmash to, I don't know. I've never, I've never had a 24 inch bass drum. They've always seemed too stupidly big for me. Yeah. Good for the, good, good for the, you know, obviously the, the, the rock stuff, cause there's a bit more kind of length, but if you're yeah. doing more thrash metal, you know, you're better off with a, you know, the smaller. I don't like a 20. I've got, I had a kit in the UK before I sold it, but, uh, <clears throat> Which was just the Yamaha, which was a which was a twenty inch bass drum. I never have a twenty inch bass drum. Yeah, well, that and was be such a thrash, mate. It was it was. I did a few demos on it, and I was pissed off. I had to sell it because it only cost me three hundred quid, and it was quite a bargain. It was a Yamaha. I like Yamahas, and it was a. Yeah. It was a fucking good kit. Yeah, because it only oh. had like only had a fourteen inch uh, floor tom. Nice. Yeah, which was which was kind of cool. I could have I would have added a sixteen, but it had the yep. fourteen inch and just the two. I think it had like a ten and a. I think it only had the ten and the twelve. It's usually the twelve and the thirteen, which are your mains ones. But it, but it was it was a nice having those small drums was a good snappy kit. You know what I mean? When you want to when you want to, which is like the Stuart Copeland stuff, which we both love. I've got my my friends. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, don't stand so close to me, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I mean the. Uh, I've got. A, I mean, that I've got guy a, blew. That guy blew everyone's mind. Yeah, well, he was probably one of the first drummers that that I really, because he was similar too with that Keith Moon kind of Rob Hurst thing. Very kind of you know just really emotive. Yeah, you know, which which I thought was you know because a lot of drummers would just sit there and you know wouldn't really do much. But in terms of like like they're really taking on the passion of the music and they're really you know coming forth with that in their performance and their playing. Um, I definitely felt some of that kind of, you know, way of playing was was kind of the way I want to play, you know, when I, especially writing the songs in, in a lot of the bands I've been in too. So there was quite a bit of an emotive thing coming through. But um, I've got a good Stuart Copeland story um, when I was going through a big phase and I've got the modern drummer mag. You would have remembered the modern drummers. Of course. Right? Yeah, the Bible of drumming. Mm -hmm. And um, so Stuart Copeland one had all these drum sizes on it. And at that time, I had a I had a Tama kit with the concert toms, the longer concert toms, which were kind of a bit more kind of, you know, Billy Cobham, uh, you know, Simon Phillips esque, Chester yeah. Thompson type of big toms. So eighties eighties power toms. That's what I yeah, like. Power, yeah. That's Nico right. McBrain, Iron Maiden. Yeah. So, but Stuart was doing the opposite, right? Because his stuff was a bit more reggae punky kind of stuff. So, anyway, I um, he's doing your he's doing your pearl export. Size toms, 
Yeah, 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 that's right. Well, my, mine was a Tama, so it was a Tama Royal Star, brown. Yeah, yeah, right. Kit. And, um, you know, I'm looking at the modern drummer, and I'm looking at the sizes Stuart Coatman has got. I'm looking at mine, and I'm going, well, that's, how can I, I looked over, I was in the shed, and I looked over, I saw, <laughs> I saw the, I saw the store, you know, <laughs> and I went, ah, ding, you know. So I got the tape measure out, and I measured the toms, and I got it all, you know, the first, especially the first three rack toms. And um, I, I took all the lugs off and all the, you know, all the, all the chrome hardware, and I just made the, the line, and I sawed, like, you know, with precision, like a laser, you know, <laughs> like, and so slowly too, because I knew, you know, these guys have the proper tools and all that, and I thought, well, we don't want to rush this, so it was very slow, it was really methodical. Got to the end, I put the head on, wound it all up, you know, went, hit the drum, and it was like, <laughs> it's like it was, I was like, oh, I've completely lost the sound. You know, it was like it was like there was just gaffer tape over, over the whole drum. And obviously, it, you know, the drums are about the bearing edge. You know, the, it, if people don't know what happens, you've got the rim of the the, the, the drum or the head that where the heads go on. You put the steel thing on, you wind it up. But the drum actually has a bearing edge, which is rounded off, and that actually helps give it its sound. So. From that point, I have to, had to get the sander out and <laughs> try and sand the bearing edge to try and bring back some of the life in the drums. I, I kind of got there, but at the end of the day, it was like, well, it kind of looks like this, so that's the main thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's like when I put gaff tape on my white kit just to look like Alex Van Halen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's what you did back then when you were young. You, oh, 100%. Can I get a red Eddie Van Halen striped guitar? I'll do it with gaff tape. And That's it. And you're halfway there. Yeah. Okay. Well, tell us about it because I actually met you. We didn't meet though. We really met more through conspiracy theory world. Yeah. And uh, uh, when I was doing comedy. You were wearing me, like this. You're wearing this kind of foil hat thing at the time. When I was yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I had, the, I had the whole suit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, have, I only had the undies, so. Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, well, so what we were talking about today. So, so I met you mainly through uh, one of these gigs I did at uh, the Emmore Theatre. Emmore Theatre, yeah, and uh, yeah, that's right. And but we sold, did sold meet. Big, big show that was. I that remember. was a big show. That was a good one. Back in the day when my agents weren't scared of me. <laughs> <laughs> now I don't have any agents. Why? Because no, it was all fun. I, wa I wonder. <laughs> yeah, it was all fun and games before the actual repercussions of what I was talking about came to came to roost. That's right. Yeah, hundred percent. But we did meet in the nineties because you were in a band. Now, was this your first band? Probably not your first band, but the first band I knew you in, which was Juice. Yeah, well, there was a, there was a couple of stages. Obviously, growing up, like I left school at um, at uh, fourteen six, and nine months. So yeah. <laughs> So just after year nine, so that would have been around year ten. So you would have been about sixteen. Uh, and I, what year is that? What year is it? Oh, jeez, that would have been uh, 80, 85, 86, something like yeah. that. Um, so there was a there was a couple of progressions. My first gig ever was with my father on stage, which was nice. I got to kind of play a show in Wollongong. That was really cool. Um, and then I got to play another show in a, his band called a band, band he was in called the party boys um and then from there i left school was hopeless at school i was actually funnily enough i was in a, a it's a weird it was a weird childhood it really was i went into this this um channel nine prime time for a year called willing and able an acting show which i was i've never wanted to be an actor but i got the part of this show for a whole year which was gave me the ability to buy a drum kit because i got paid and some surfboards. Um, and I got that because of my uncle, Doug, who wrote the theme song, and they couldn't find an actor to play the street kid part. But I got I got the part, and I didn't want the part. I went for it just as a giggle, but I actually got the part, which absolutely mortified me because of like the, the thought of learning lines, remembering lines, I was a completely terrible speller and not a very good reader at that point. So I got <laughs> chucked right in, and we're talking like, you know, yeah, you know, you're going telly. on the telly. I'm going on the telly. You know, this is like a nightmare. I just break down in, in tears. I'm not bloody doing this, you know. And there's no, and you know, the family. It's like my, it's like, it's like, like my, my first comedy gigs in the Netherlands. Yeah, <laughs> just, just, just four or five days of dying on stage in front of oh, just, 
mate, it was it was like you know it was oh my god. Anyway, so I, I and that was like <laughs> kind of like I got to do that, which bought, had gave me the ability, as I said, to buy, like buy a drum kit. I did that for a year, got out of that, and then I joined a, a cover band called the the Rolling Clones, which was. It had Mark Evans on bass guitar, the ACDC bass player, who's famous for the first two or three um, Akadaka albums. Now, Mick Cox wrote from Rose Tattoo on guitar. So I, was, I spent like two and a half years in that band, really, you know, kind of learning Ch- Charlie Watt stuff, although I was listening to completely different players. But then out of that, I, I actually, from there, I actually I went and got another um, gig for two years in the theatre production which was two years touring Australia playing 50s music in the Buddy Holly Theatre show, which was incredible because all of a sudden I've just I've gone right back to the start of kind of rock and roll and played these Buddy Holly songs, you know. And I was also acting it at times too because I was the understudy for the, like the man. This was live theatre in front of 1,500 people, eight shows a week. So I was playing like eight shows a week in the Buddy Holly Theatre show. I was 20. And I'm just giving you a little bit of the timeline because before I joined Juice, this is just before I joined Juice. So, um, and Krishna and Amanath, who are fantastic players, incredible guitar players and songwriters, um, I obviously went to school with them. So, um, and by the time I got out of the Buddy Holly show, they had created a band called Juice, which was a kind of funky, psychedelic mm. blues yeah. rock band kind of Hendrixy esque you know, Sly and the Family Stone meets Led Zeppelin, whatever. Yeah, I remember um, it. Yeah. It was, even, it was even a bit Red Hot Chili Peppers at times. Yeah, yeah, it was a bit of that because that was stuff was starting to That, that stuff of, was coming through the underground then. That, that, that's right. And I wanted to get out of the Buddy Holly show and I, I, I was like, how can I get out? Because it was contractual, right? So I was like, I was getting a bit tired of playing, you know, Pegasus. <laughs> only so much paradiddles you can do you know what I mean? so, so um yeah so i i um I, I thought i'll shave my head and i shaved my head completely bored so i almost looked like a neo-nazi or something <laughs> like back in the day <laughs> you know it was like ridiculous and they absolutely you know were mortified because you know you had that a quiff like a 50s quiff which was oh, fun no. to, you know mm. which was fun to comb your hair all forward and get the gel and you know, and then you're up on stage doing 50s music. That was really cool. But um, anyway, so I say that and they 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 ha- they let me go. So straight after that and then Juice was just starting to come about. So I joined that band, which was an original band, mm. which was fantastic. It was, you know, fast forward a little bit more now. We're kind of in that, you know, quasi kind of 70s-ish kind of style of a sound, you know, mm. late, late 60s. Um, and you know the band was doing quite well to the point where they got signed to Polydor Records. You know, we we actually Krishna was only I think he was seventeen, and he wrote pretty much the whole music for the Wine of Life album. Signed to Polydor, recorded at three hundred one, big Neve desk, mm. ta- tape, uh, you know, click tracks, fantastic. You know, and we 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 did quite well. We made it quite a bit of a um, quite a um. A notoriety for ourselves to some degree. We played with we toured with In Excess nationally. We toured with Oh, did you? Yeah, we toured with Huda Gurus um nationally, Radiohead. Like we did Tea Party. We did quite a few big tours. Yeah, right. It actually it actually did quite well. And you might have met us on the we did this Assault the Census tour, which was with Scary Mother. Um oh, what was that band? But, um, oh, there was two other bands that I forget. No. Well, I was impressed. Def Rhyme. Def, Def Rhyme. Def oh, Def Rhyme. That was a DeFonte right. Brothers, I think. Yeah, and there was another band called The Truth, I think. So, um, yeah, so it was a package deal tour around Australia. Maybe you might have kind of, because that's when we, you know, there was this kind of amalgamation of like kind of grunge meets, you know, the kind of juice was a little bit more in that kind of Lenny Kravitz meets, you yeah. know, you know, the, the, the Black Crows meets Hendrixy style. Yeah. And then you had a bit more. So, you know, that, you might have kind of come across us through that possibly, but we, we, you know, oh, we, gig, we, we, gig, well, we did the big day. We gig oh, with right. you. Yeah, yeah, we okay. would have done, we did right. gigs Presto, with you. Right, no way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We ended up, we did national tours with the Angels, Hunters and Collectors. We made two records, except that, uh, Jim Hilburn, who was a bass player from the Angels, who actually produced the second Presto album, which the first one I we did. I fully remember that band. Yeah, and it was like a, 
it's like it's like it's vanished. I've got nothing of it. I've got no archival footage of bands, uh, which is another topic you could go into. But yeah, we did gigs with you when when there was. Oh, I remember which which venue was it? it was down on the harbour there, Darling Harbour. Oh it yeah, a, it was I the nineties. So there was tons of there was just that was a that was a great venue. But that um, oh, what was that bloody called? Uh, if you know what it is, people in the chat, leave a comment. Yeah, because there, there, well, there was tons of venues then. It was good. So yeah, was, you know, we we were in that whole sort of scene as well. Where sometimes we play with metal bands because we knew lots of metal bands. We came from metal bands, but we also. I mean, a lot of people mock the nineties, but I thought it was great. I liked it when, when everything went. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was great. The eighties were killer. Lots of people mock the eighties, but I was into underground thrash metal, so it was the best decade of my life. And then, mm. but I like the nineties. I like the, like we were talking before we came out. I like some Pearl Jam songs. I was never big into Nirvana. I liked the first album because I heard it through these punk chicks. Well, I was the same because and, I, and, you know, but, 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 but I liked all that. Well, you got you had Nine Inch Nails to. Corey Amos, Jellyfish, Fishbone. Fishbone, great. Love that drum. Y- you know, you had saw them live. I saw them live. Yeah, I saw them live at uh, Paddington. Yeah, oh, man, it was a, such a something. great time for me. Like, that was, it, was it, was a, killer. it was an ama- amazing time for me. I mean, you know, obviously Nirvana came in and, you know, it was like napalm. So if you did, and obviously Juice wasn't anywhere near like what Nirvana was. We were definitely more, more kind of blues, funky stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, and whatever else, which was, you know, its own right was really we thought was great. But when Nirvana hit, if you, in Australia, if you weren't wearing a flannel or docks or had that type of look, you were just, that was it. Your career was over, you know. <laughs> so I was, I kind of came out of juice. Um, uh, for we a had, while. You had to be so, silver chair, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was kind of, well, that's right. There was a bit of that going on too. But, yeah, I, I ended up um, getting, this is when I, I, I kind of started playing with Flynn from the, the singer and guitarist um, from Cog. And I went to school with Flynn. Right. Uh, and my cousin was in the in the band as well. But um, the Hanging Tree was the next thing out of right. Out, okay, out of Juice, Juice took a break for a while. We kind of kept going. I wanted to kind of. I just felt like I needed a little bit more, you know, to branch out with my style of playing and feel a little bit more of that heavier style of playing because you know yeah, there yeah. I am. You know, back in the day, I was really liking you know Black Sabbath, ACDC, you know some of those heavier rock bands, and you know. Uh, Van Halen, whatever, and um, I, I when it got to the '90s and all that kind of um, stuff came in, you know, which was your Sound Gardens and your Alice in Chains and these type of bands, um, Caius, you know, those type of bands. I was I was really enjoying that sound, and I and it kind of took me back to that time when I was younger with that, you know, it was kind of surf culture and skate culture. We used to listen to a lot of that yeah, stuff, yeah, right. and, and so I I I, I um, joined a band called The Hanging Tree. Which was a you know sludgy stoner rock metal punk band, and um, and we we did an album that was that was fantastic. Too what year time. would this be? What year would this be? Um, oh geez, it all just blends into one sometimes. Um, but that would have been would have been early two thousands. Oh, okay, for, right. for, for sure. Yeah, because it yeah, just took, kind of took it. Well, kept going, but I left to do that for a while. Um, and then, yeah, the Hanging Tree was, you know, we played with Fear Factory, we, we played with uh, Screaming Jets, we played with, you know, we did a few. It was going, we did some great recordings on Triple J, um, kind of like live at the wireless stuff. Uh, and we, that was doing quite well as well. So that, and that was just before kind of COG. Did that make um, it, did you make an album with that band? The Hanging Tree? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we've actually just put it up on Spotify. And oh, okay. Because right. it was, and, you know, those obviously recording in those days, like I run a recording studio now in Byron, Key Sound Studios, and I've always been fascinated in recording and, you know, being on that other side of the fence, so to speak. And, um, you know, recording those, recording that album, which was done in Charing Cross in Bronte in Sydney, two-inch tape, analog Neve desk, and it was a performance for the mix. So you had the whole band on the, on the, on the, the board panning, you know, sending reverbs, you know, muting, doing all whatever they needed to do, what we needed to do to make it you know, kind of sound good before it went to, you know, going to dat tape. Yeah. And it was a performance of the mix. So not only did you perform, you know, the actual uh, playing of the track and, and recording it, but then it was time to mix and you had to do a performance on the board. Not like now, right? We've got Pro Tools, it's all, you know, a whole different kettle. Yeah, of I remember that. The whole band on a fader. 
Yeah, it's a whole bag. Oh, you, 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 you missed you miss the mute, you know, or you, oh, you fucking idiot, you know. Like, yeah. they go back to the song, do it another 10 times to try and get it right. But, um, yeah, it was, it, it was, it was great. And that was, that was the tape great. splicing days with Ray. Oh, oh, mate, miracle. It's a miracle. Like, it, yeah, compared to what we got now. But, yeah, so that album, um, is on Spotify. People can listen. Listen to that. It's a great album. Uh, it's no clip tracks. It's all very, very raw, very punk. Um, and that's made with the guy who's in Cog, the guitarist singer. Yeah, Flynn was Flynn was the guitar player, and he couldn't couldn't sing at that stage. He was yeah, you know, right. He, he was, He's a good singer. Well, he, he became an incredible singer. I got a very original style. He doesn't for me. He doesn't really. He, yeah, sometimes he sounds a little bit like that Peter Gabriel or, or Phil Collins kind of style or you know a little bit sting to some degree but um but yeah he's he's got his own his own style and then out of the hanging tree um was cog basically i i cog uh, sorry the hanging tree disbanded for a little while um i left to go to america and i was like i'm out of here you know i need to try and create something go where all the fuss is yeah, you know, I've been touring in Australia for like, you know, already for like fourteen years. You know? <laughs> and I was like, I, I need some new pasture, you know, like I could chew on some new new grass and new fat or something. Mate, I know what you mean. I mean, that's why I left to do comedy over there. And as I was, I was saying, like, I can't wait to do a big tour here now that I'm back because because the problem with Australia, say when I was selling out those theaters, two thousand seater theaters and stuff, then I could I'd, I'd get a new show. I might do one show or two in Sydney, one in Melbourne, one in Perth, one in Adelaide, one in Brisbane, and then I finished. But really, I've only done the show seven times. Yeah, it's like where do you, where else do you go? <laughs> it's like- and, and 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 not only where else do I go, but but when I was doing sixty date tours in in the UK, s- seven dates into it, the show's starting to work. Mm. Oh, right, yeah. right. So uh, so so. So, so not seven days. It's over. Seven days. The show is starting to work. It's it's tattooed into me now. Right now, I can perform. Then I'm on the road. So then I I write new bits. I drop that bit. I move this bit. I come up with stuff on stage. And so by the time I'm at, at, at gig forty, I'm a killing machine. You know what I mean? It's not the same as Right, right, and so and then by by the time I'm sixty, shows in, well, I have a mental breakdown. But but apart from that, <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> but I understand, as he said, want to go to the states because you want to get out of here because it does become frustrating here that you're just continually doing stuff to nothing. Yeah, and and as you said, you know, you if you do build it up to a certain, um, I guess you know, a certain amount of people, you can't overplay, you know, you saturate the market. So you've got to kind of like, you know, pull back a little bit, which is super yeah. frustrating because, as you said, then you can't, you know, you do a show, you do 20 dates and, you you know, the band's sounding great and you, you really, you know, you're not, you're just really flowing with it, you know, you're not even having to think too much and you're oh, just really mate. flowing with it. And it feels really good. And then, you know, obviously you're you're off. Uh, for a few months or so, and and then you lose that momentum, you lose that ability to you know kind, kind of connect. And I mean, it's great to have a break. I mean, sometimes when you have that like two or three week break, yeah, and then you come back, it feels even better, you know. And if you go on to you know do an extra ten or so shows or whatever, but in Australia, yeah, it's so so frustrating. In Australia, such a big country, such a small population. Um, so yeah, for me, it was just like, uh, and I I was like, what do I, what do I do next? You know, I've got, I've got to. And there was a certain kind of way I wanted to approach and play music, which was just bringing in some of that more technical ability to some degree, you know, into my playing and, and have the songs be a little bit more um, progressive to some degree, but keep the elements of that heaviness and that, you know, but also use the dynamics of light and shade and and all sorts of things. And, you know, so I was getting into, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, tinfoil hat stuff before. So it was like I was starting to try and learn about the world too and what's actually going on here, who's running this this show, you know, what's I'm hearing these bands, you know, they're performing, they're writing these songs against the, you know, political uh, sphere of, of politics and, you know, really not happy people, you know, they're, they're really – so I was looking at the world through a different lens and, you know, wanted to try and – 
somehow bring that all together, you know, with my playing and I was obviously writing as well on the guitar. I picked up a guitar at age 13 and never stopped playing and started writing songs as well. So, um, yeah, left for America, went straight to L.A., LA and landed there for a while and got a job on Sunset Strip in a, in a bar and um, and started writing music yeah, from right. there and that's and that's where Cog kind of came out of out of there and you know the plan was was to stay there create a band uh, I found the name Cog in a dictionary I thought well it's got to be a name in here it's just a million bloody yeah. words <laughs> you know got to got to be able to come up with something. And there was this name Cog, and I thought, well, that's interesting, you know, securing constant variation within the engaged. And I went, oh, that's pretty, pretty good. And I like the fact that you know you need a few parts to make something work. It was it had that kind of like ethical kind of like you know middle class working thing, you know, like where you kept this the middle class that keeps the backbone of any country going. You know what I mean? They're the workers. They're the ones with the ideas. You know, they're the, they're, the, they're the strong force, so to speak. You know, so um, it kind well, of makes sense. and also, and Flynn liked it too. Like he, he, and I was a bit iffy about it, and he, and he was like, "Nah, that's great. It's like it's only short. There's three letters. You know, as he would look bold on a poster. You know, he's a graphic designer, right? So yeah, he he was into kind of that. You know, seeing what he could potentially make out of it as a work. You know, for branding and you know as a, as our logo and all that stuff. So um. So that was the name. So, yeah, but, and basically what happened was he rung me from Australia and wasn't quite happy where he was musically. He wanted to kind of progress. He um, was sending me tapes, you know, not WAV files over the internet, tapes, <laughs> cassette tapes, yeah. um, uh, you know, going across the, across the sea. And um, I was getting those and hearing some good parts. I was writing and blah, 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 and we started talking on the phone. He was going to move to... America as well. He sold all his gear, uh, and we were going to start a band there. You know, we're just going to kick it off in America and not come back. You know, yeah, and, right. and try yeah. and because we'd done the touring circles, so it only made sense to kind of branch out and go somewhere. You know, where you've obviously heard for the, the most of your life, where most of the, the music you've listened to has come from, and um, see what we can do. And unfortunately, I lost my job, which then I started to run out of money. Um, so I came, had to come back to Australia with my, t I didn't tell Flynn, <laughs> I was like, he was, he was almost like weeks away from getting his plane ticket and saving madly and excited to come over. And I ended up on the doorstep, you know, knocking on his door and he's like, what are you doing here? I'm supposed to be like coming up. <laughs> and I was like, mate, I got, I got sacked. I lost my money. I, the, the visa was starting to run out. So anyway, we just, you know, we just started kicking it off from there and, um, you know, writing music. Both what year together. is this? Uh, so this would have been like 2003. Right, okay. Then. Yeah. <clears throat> so, and we were writing, um, you know, music and we, we were basically, it was just a two piece really. It was just him on guitar. Didn't know he could sing at that point. And we did, the idea was to find a bass player and to find a, a singer, uh, which we kind of did. We auditioned a bunch of, you know, um, bass players and, and, um, you know, singers, we found a singer that kind of hooked up for a little while and we couldn't, at that point, we couldn't quite find, we still couldn't find the right singer or the right bass player. So we just recorded all the music ourselves, Flynn and I, in a room, a stage door, little plug stage door, you know, productions in, out there in, in Sydney, great little yeah. rehearsal room. Yeah. We recorded the, the EPs that we did as a demo. They were meant to be demos, which actually ended up becoming the album because you know it was a demo meant to go to the record company meant to try and get funding to do the proper thing so um you know and at this point there was no singer on the music you know i'd put the bass down i played bass on on the whole two eps still didn't really have a singer and flynn was just you know noodling around coming up with stuff and and putting ideas down you know and then he turned turned around and he goes well can't find a singer the one that we did find unfortunately left he was he was really kind of cool Probably they're always the difficult things to find man yeah well he he left to go and go back to his acting thing and and because uh, he'd been studying at the con or something like that for acting or, and so his parents invested a lot of money there and you know um yeah justin cotter his name was and he came up with some of the ideas for some of the lyrics and some of the songs too and i think we did do a few performances as, as a, a four piece but um 
Yeah, so Flynn was like, well, I'm going to be the singer. I'm over this. And I was like, oh, no, how's he going to sing and play guitar? You know, like these are tricky parts, you know, like so. And then we still couldn't find the bass player. And then Luke, which is Flynn's brother, you know, eight years younger, uh, was playing in a few bands and playing bass. And he was kind of, you know, getting into the music. And it got to that point where Flynn was like, well, let's just get Luke. Let's just try him out. And I was like, oh. He's, he's never played really. I don't think this is going to work, you know. Um, anyway, <laughs> you know, Luke went and bought the best bass, the best bass rig you could buy, and he, I think he sat in the bedroom for like, you know, two or three months, you know, didn't come out to eat, you know, <laughs> just learnt everything. And um, we had an audition and um, he came in and I was a bit kind of like, yeah, come see us what you've got, show us what you've got, kid, <laughs> show us what you've got, kid, you know. And Flynn's very, you know, it's his brother, you know. He's he's like, and I was obviously love Luke too because he was, you know, he was the younger in the crew, the surf skating crew around town. You know, we were all kind of hanging out and whatnot. But I just didn't, I just didn't see him as a, as a player. You know what I mean? Um, and he nailed it. He just absolutely nailed everything, and it felt so good. He was right in the pocket. I was like, he's right there. This is fantastic. Well, that, he's the guy. Let's. You know, and he was stoked. So then we were a three-piece and we started playing as an instrumental band because we still didn't really have the vocals, you know, and we were building each gig we would do. Flynn would kind of add more lyrics and more melodies. I started to do a little bit of singing and background vocals and, you know, adding a few things. And we ended up recording all the vocals and slowly but surely Flynn would sing and play, adding as, you know, per show and getting better at his playing and then kind of morphed out of that and it was just... You know, that's what it was, a three-piece, and he had this voice and it was like, wow, that's like, that's really interesting. I haven't really heard a voice like that. You know? Yeah, well, that's so, interesting. I didn't know I didn't know this band formed through through that in, in that. Well, I like that kind of story. It's it's a good way for bands. Uh, I'll, do, I'll just, that's, a, that's the way thrash metal started, when no, one could, find, no one could was, find anything you sing. Like, I'll pick up the hammer. I'll start yeah. you know, hitting this bit of wood over here and making that work and building that. Is it exactly what it was, you know? And it was, and then we just, you know, we had the, we had the EP. Um, well, we had the music, and we we couldn't get a record deal. No one wanted to know. What year so, did this come out? Two thousand and three or something? Yeah, like two thousand two thousand and three around that period. We 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 kind of we were playing around town a lot, creating our own gigs, putting out poll posters. You know, egg and water and flour or whatever it was. Putting old them school, place, old school. You know, like just going for it. You know, having wars with the the, the other people that were putting pole posters up and ripping them down, and we'd go back and put them up. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, "Fuck you!" And you know, it was the poster wars. Bill you know? posters will be prosecuted. Yes, that's it. And I came up with this genius idea called slippery slippings, which you'd get a little flyer like this, and you'd go to all the you know um, news agents around town. And you go to, you know, surf mags, Rolling Stone music mags, you know, the skate mags, and you just slip your flyer in. You just stand there and just slip your flyer in, like, you know, da 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 da, you know, slip, slip, slippery slip ins, I call them. I used to just go everywhere and just. That's a great you know, idea. And I was like, I'm not paying, you know, this flyer falls out of the Rolling Stone mag where you'd probably pay three grand to put it in there. You know, I was like, I was like, that's the way to do it. Slip that's a good way to do it. it. That's full COVID, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So totally. Like, totally. It and then they started putting the bloody plastic on the the the, 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 oh. the uh, magazines. And I was like, is that my fault? <laughs> <laughs> hey. right. so, uh, so, yeah, we, we, you know, we started to make a bit of a fuss and then we did a residency uh, and that really accumulated a lot of people. We ended up doing this residency for like, you know, where at? I know four months at Excelsior Hotel in Surrey Hills. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excelsior, like, yeah, probably. Yeah, and that was great. It was really, really good. And then that started a few, you know, industry people started to come along. And um, one chap called Owen Orford, who had a booking agency, saw us and came. And from there, that was when we started to, you know, you know, we'd released the EPs by then. We kind of like no one wanted to know. We just mixed it ourselves. Um, you know, we started, you know, selling them at gigs and we put it out. And Owen Orford heard the music, loved it, and, you know, kind of took us under his wing and, you know, got us some great supports, you know, with like She Had, Grinspoon, and then System of a Down was a big one. We played with them at the Horton Pavilion, and that's when it really kind of started to take off. And we got a, I uh, remember Channel V, they had a television uh, thing called Channel V, and we did like yeah. about six songs live on this 
this show. And that was like, and by that time we were we were playing like you know every weekend, like three or four times a week, and uh, we were and rehearsing, and we were sounding pretty good, you know, like so, and very tight. So we did that show, and then from there, everything started to kind of unfold. More gigs, um, we got some big day out spots, um, which was great, and kind of went from there, you know. And then we got a label that joined after that because we kind of finished the EP and now it was like time to write an album, which we wrote the new normal. Um, that's and, funny. It was called the new normal before all that lockdown rubbish. That's exactly right. So yeah, we were, you know, Flynn and I, especially back in the hanging tree, you know, we had a song called new world order and there was a couple, and it was very kind of politically narratively motively driven to some degree that hanging tree stuff. And that kind of morphed, you know, into the into cog, and we, you know, we were very interested in in what's going on. You know, we were into the obviously, as I said, you know, like Pink Floyd or or you know, um, Pink um, uh, Midnight Oil, Rage Against the Machine. You know, these bands that were kind of like speaking out against you know government yeah. stuff and tyranny. Which strangely and, enough, have ended up being government bands. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, paid paid through the back door, possibly. I hated Rage Against the Machine. I always hated them. Yeah, well, the funny, the funny thing is I remember back in the day, like, you know, because I was just right into the music kind of more than the politics, but really kind of, you know, listening to, to what they were trying to say. But I remember this guy saying, mate, they're not, you know, like these guys are signed to the biggest corporate label in the world, you know, like they're not, you know, and I'm like, yeah, but listen to this riff. <laughs> this riff. Do, you know, do you know what's funny? I hated their riffs. I fucking don't like that guitarist. And, he, and he's so well-known in guitarist. What's his name? Oh. Tom, Tom. Tom fucking Morello, not the Morello, Morello or something. Yeah, seems like a decent bloke, but you know his guitaring has bored the shit out of me. I, 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 I just, I'm just, uh, no, I don't want to fucking listen to this guy. Yeah, but they, I mean, they, these bands were kind of saying, trying to say something against. God, totally, yeah, totally. So I, so I was just like very interested in that too, and then obviously we started. You know, I got a skateboard deck once and, you know, I looked at the back of it and it was said Illuminati, New World Order, you know, world, you know, domination through the blah, 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 blah. It's on the back of a skateboard deck. And I'm like, you know, okay, I've heard, <laughs> I've heard these terms of before. I've heard these words and terms. What is going on here? So you start, you know, getting a few books. There's two books. There's three books. You get more. You get more. Um, and this is kind of just before the internet too, right? So you were really going to these bookstores and you were trying to find what you could find and you know, totally, just try, trying to, I guess, understand the world but also have something to sing about, you know, like something to talk about when you're writing a song, you know, uh, looking at society. Well, it's, funny, and, it's funny you say this before the internet because when all this, all this bullshit uh, lockdown rubbish started and, and people were mocking people who were against it, on the internet, I could see that one of their one of their go tos was just because you've seen a couple of videos, you know, you've watched a couple of videos on the internet for two weeks. So no, 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 no. That's right. Yeah. I've read hundreds of fucking books before the internet. Yes. Right? Remember them books? Yes. Well, it's like I was talking because I watched your clip the other day. Which one was it? It was the Are You Interested one, which is full blown popper conspiracy stuff. Even Jordan Maxwell at the end. Yeah, black God bless him. And uh, old smart, school. You know. And as I said to you when we were chatting on the phone the other day, you know, because it's been bugging me recently because every every if every, every dickhead and his dog has got a YouTube channel now about about the ramifications of what feminism did and and what's gone on with lockdowns and what's happened to men with the feminism or what's gone on with the gay stuff and what's going on with the new world orders and the word Illuminati just gets thrown around now and and I knew they'd do it. I knew they'll they'll bring it into the mainstream to dilute it all. Sure. Do you, do you know what I mean? It's the same way they're going to make pornography completely normal. Yes. Yes. Right, which I can tell now because I looked up about three days ago going, I wonder if they've got interviews with porn stars because I thought they'll start making porn stars either into bands or, or pop stars or video clips because they've basically made video clips like porn anyway, and I thought they'll probably market actual porn stars to become pop stars, then they'll make pornographic clips. And so then the other day I thought, I wonder if there's porn star interviews on the internet, and of course looked up straight away, and this channel is completely dedicated. We're now talking to porn stars. So this is the way young people, you start to think, well, like it's like it's, compl it's a completely normal job. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, I mean, we, with that with that <laughs> film with that film clip that we we did. I mean, the new normal was a phrase that was kind of you know meant new world order to some degree. Yeah, you know? totally. So so that and we on the album we had it in braille and we had a megaphone and, and stuff like that and you know it, it was just kind of like a, a futuristic sci-fi esque album you know like in terms of like what was to come the books we were reading you know uh, this is what's down the track here if we don't you know pay attention and have well a that video at, clip is know. kind of like the intro to my first comedy dvd right where it's, where it's all where it's all yeah. Skynet video yeah. footage yeah. of people. That's one of my first video is it's all done with a uh, yeah. that thing where you look at the earth. I can't remember the names of these computer what, things. Google Earth or something. Like CGI. Good. Go <laughs> <laughs> Google Earth. Photo or painting. Yeah. The biggest, the biggest one at all. Biggest so, one of all. Yeah. And that was like that clip, actually, because it was bringing me up as this kind of threat and so forth, which is what's happening in those clips. And as I said, see, I and – <clears throat> no, you know, I'm old school. Like, I don't like the fact that Metallica made – we live in an age now where 14-year-old where, where girls come on the internet doing a reaction video to Cannibal Corpse songs. Right? <laughs> right. And see, see, I don't want 14-year-old girls from the mainstream to know who Cannibal Corpse is. Right? Yeah, see, well, see, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, because it's, it's kind of like when you get those people, you go, really, do they know the band? You go, so what song do you like out of that band? They go, well, uh, I don't know. Well, they, even, well, they, just, they, they just they just wear the t-shirt because. But to me, it's not even the fact if they wear it or they like it. It's the fact that they know about it, right? Right. See, 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 see this destroys the underground for me. Right. The thing yeah, I but like. Then, yeah, but then you've got to go to the underground, underground. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's what I call Australia underneath the underground. <laughs> but it, but it, but it's, but it, do you get my point? It's like, it's like, see this whole this whole idea where these young people have thought that. Everyone should be able to express themselves no matter what they want, and society should just accept them for the way they want to express themselves, right? And so, that, which seems all lovely, right? Well, we kind of already have been doing that anyway. We kind know? of had it. Well, well, we kind of had it, right? Right. Yeah, just, but see, so. the thing there wasn't is, as much focus put on it, I think. <laughs> well, it's just, I was thinking this the other day when I was in like a metalhead and in, into in Slayer and fucking destruction and creator and fucking, uh, right? And I know punks and goths. I know. I know our status on the mainstream hierarchy, right, 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 right. It's it's down here. Why? Because we're not adding much to the whole system functioning. It's like what you were saying before. The mainstream, the, the, the middle class is what kept the system functioning, right? They obeyed the law. They paid their taxes. They had two to three kids. They, they went to work every day. The, the engine room. The engine room. So they're the, coming. The, the cogs. They're cogs. They're plumbers. They they fix the roads. They run the businesses. They make sure the sewage works. The electricity works. This this and that's who used to get things like tax breaks and stuff if they had kids, didn't they? Right, right. But now, because of this PC nonsense, they've to me they've transferred the the hierarchy of status to people who used to be outsiders, mm. and they do anything to the to the middle class mainstream. The cogs that keep it together. They do anything to destroy them. Hundred percent high tax, yeah, yeah. tons of rules for going camping or setting up a business <laughs> or putting a pergola in your backyard or you want to have a barbecue yeah. or you want to have this and so now they hassle them. But some guy in a wig, who who when we grew up would have been well, you, we, 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 you've got rights. We're not going to kill you, but mate, you're not you're, you're not part of the high status functioning. Why you're an outcast? We chose to be outcasts. So now when there's 16-year-old girls to know who Cannibal Corpse is, now you all think, hey, we're expanding so everyone's accepted. No, the system has sucked you all in. 100%. Without you even knowing. It, it sucked you all in without you even knowing, right? Because yeah. I don't want my goths working at the garden centre. <laughs> because, 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 now, because now you're not a goth. <laughs> Right, see, 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 it's what people don't seem to understand. They just they're 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 for technology. So they hate nature. They hate life, and they hate nature. But everything has a nature. So when you're a goth, what? Well, you want to be a vampire queen, don't you? Or, or, or right, right? Who do you follow? I like Christopher Lee and graveyards and black clothes, and I want to be a goth. Well, don't work at the garden center. <laughs> 
Because, because now the nature of being a goth has just vanished to me. Like, hi, I'm here, I'm accepted with it. No, 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 you're supposed to be a vampire queen. Yeah. Uh, we don't want you working at the bakery at Baker's Delight. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the identity is a big is a big thing because, I mean, because you're living an illusion to start with and it's just, you know, what you're looking through your eyes and just what you're experiencing is so out there that if you yeah. haven't got, like, some kind of idea identity to kind of ground you you feel like like well, what's going on so people you know they branch for anything i prefer not to really identify with um you know obviously there's the biological aspect of things but you know it, to, to to play a part of being you know really i i just belong to uh, you know nature in the, in the creation sense you know um and that seems to ground me a lot but you know Having to wear this or dye this or, or you know listen to that or you know I think the the tapestry of of, of being a, eclectic and and having different experiences and looking at different uh, situations you know it's, it's, for me it's a better better kind of palette to kind of eat with so to speak you know what I mean it's a it's a broader well, brush it's a broader brush it's not you know I, I find especially with bands they can really narrow themselves down into genres and, and you know they can't escape that and that comes with an identity and a look and and all sorts of things where really, you know, the, the music's the transient part. Yeah. Because it's, well, it's, it's, you're, not, you're not really looking to some degree. You're listening, you know. You're, you're listening to the, the aftermath of, of the, you know. I understand the, what I, you're saying in, a, in, in the idea where you want to be open-minded, right, right. And I used to like this. I wasn't a guy who got upset if Metallica, like everyone goes, the Black Album came out and it was weird. No, I didn't think it was weird. I thought it was the perfect. You know, the album it was like cut. when they it was like when they cut their hair. I was like, oh my god! Yeah, but see, 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 but see, but see, I, back in the music, you know. No, 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 no. See, see, I used to think like this, but now I don't so much anymore because because when you try, yes, you can be open minded. Yeah, I came from metal world, and I was totally into death metal, thrash metal. You're from... open minded. You're very open minded. I'm fully open minded, but I used to be, but I used to go like. You know that there was a there was a, a a funk metal phase in the late eighties, early nineties, right? We're going to have bands like Mordred and and uh, oh, Mind Funk, and you know it's, it's these. So so we're we're going to now try and cross over. I like the you know I come from the world where punk crossed over and the, the idea of crossing over and can it expand out and. And I used to think great because I'm an open-minded guy, but I also realised, yeah, but you've got to you, you can sometimes lose the nature of what it is. Yeah, for sure. I hundred percent. Yeah, with this, saying, yeah, yeah, with this cross pollination. Yeah, you know. So if you're if you're in Gorgoroth, where every mm. song is about Satan and you've got blood covering you and spikes and fun, yeah. well, you don't mix some funk lines in. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, yeah. Well, that's that's that gets a bit silly when I get yeah, you, right, you, right. you can get silly. That's that's fine. I mean, I love yeah, listening. Yeah. Love listening to Frank Zappa, and he was very eclectic in all different styles and amalgamation. But he he, he could make it work, you know. Some same band, some bands just wouldn't be able to make that work. No, you know, well, that's that's, that's, that's sure. what culture's becoming. It's like it's like yeah. you're all getting caught. There. Hey, we can all be one big family, and I'm like, well, I don't want to be in your family. Yeah, like, yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't, no. I don't I know what you're getting at, but you. But the thing is, it's being manipulated by people who don't have this in mind for you. Mm. I know yeah. you think they do, right? Like, yeah. well, that's so I, I do that joke, you know. Well, why can't I get a job in the bank? Because because you had my my mates when they had <laughs> mohawks. You know, we know <laughs> the old right. joke I've got. Well, yeah. well, well, you had the mohawk to be discriminated against. Yeah, that's right. Now you want to get a normal job. See, now you want to wear them over and go, well, why can't I be accepted? Because you don't want to be accepted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's that's the good part. Because also what, to me, what they take away from you when they apparently accept you is what? Well, it's it's being in a death metal band in 1985 in the Blue Mountains of Sydney, right? What are my chances of success? <laughs> nil. <laughs> Just yeah. nil, right? Yeah. But I did it anyway. And the idea that there was something to push against that was doing everything to make sure you don't succeed gave you impetus to do it. Yeah. You didn't the, go, the, the, well, how, how come we only get four video, four heavy metal clips on the three hour rock show? It's not fair. Maybe you should, well, because no, most people don't like it. Well, it's interesting how that, you know, it's just those kind of thrash metal heavy genres have become very very mainstream oh mate yeah. Yeah, i'm not happy about it at all you know and, and it's and <laughs> but i but i think there's something psychological and 
and deeper spiritual ramifications going on there with that whole thing, you know, which is a whole other conversation. But uh, Yeah, yeah, that, we know. should have another conversation. Before we go, yeah. we're coming up yeah. to the end of the hour. I want to talk about some of your favourite drummers because I've got because I've got some of my favourite drummers here and it's great to have a drummer to chat to because as we were talking the other day on the phone, there is those drummers which all drummers kind of like, like Billy Cobham and... Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, one yeah. of my favourites, yeah. Yeah, and there's, yeah. The album, just, album Spectrum, he did an album called Spectrum, yeah. which, is, which, is, which actually had the bass line for that Massive Attack tool. Oh, ah, right. Oh, did they? So that's a Billy Cobham song. They ripped the, the little snippet there of the, the sample and that became part of the Massive Attack. That's it would have been tra- great for great. Billy's bank balance, I'd, I'd say. It's a great track. <laughs> it's a really, really cool track, yeah. yeah. Great album. Well see, well, see, he's one of those monsters like, 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 like uh, who were we talking about the other day for Missing Persons? Terry Bozio. Terry Bozio, right. These these yeah. these these gods. I, and, and Neil Peart is a god I liked, like everybody likes. Yeah. But I but I there. but I I liked I ended up liking drummers who worked well in songs who didn't really get mentioned by drummers or drum mags. You know what I mean? Sure. Like 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 I really like like I like Mick Fleetwood. Yeah, great drummer. Oh. Fantastic drummer. Do you know what's so great about him? When you listen to a, I was listening to the, some of that track off. Uh, I don't know. I'm not a massive Fleetwood Mac fan. I don't know all their music, but I've, I know the album that everybody knows. Uh, Broomers. Yeah. Great tracks on there, and and listen to some of the Fleetwood. The great thing about Mick Fleetwood is, is as you're listening to him, you almost can't hear him. He's so in the pocket. It's, it's, it, this was so great about him. He knows exactly how to play, so he's he's there. Yeah. But he's kind of not there. Yeah, it would have been part of the production too. I'd, I'd imagine. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. He, he does have a real kind of because drums a, are very. And I think he uses a twenty-four inch kick drum. If I'm not. Yeah, wrong. I think and, he does and too, actually, and, and actually quite big drums. So big I, drums, but he has a very condensed sound. A very yeah, very, yeah. But when you're playing those songs, right, like which are pretty stripped back and real stripped obviously, back, obviously, uh, you know, kind of soul songs to some degree. Um, yeah, like in a in a room with a drum kit that big, and you're playing it, you'd have to try and you know pacify that kit to some degree. But then yeah. that would have that would actually become part of the unique kind of sound within that style of, of music or that style. Of oh, and totally, and just his style of drumming. He'll he'll he. Well, he's very emotive. You know, he's got that very really, emotive, and he lets yeah. he lets he lets the drum feel hang a bar or two over where you think it's going to land. Yeah, and I right, think so, that, so, that, so you think it's gonna you think it's gonna end at the end of the bar, but he kind of yeah he shifts it one yeah. or two more, like Dave Gilmore were doing guitar. We think the lick's gonna end, and it kind of it kind of fall, it keeps falling into it. <laughs> yeah. But so he's and uh, do you like uh, do you like Manu Kashe? You know this guy? Yeah, I do know Manu Kashe. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, that um, I think it was the album So from um, Yeah, yeah. He's from on So. Peter, Ga- Peter Gabriel. So there's a few. Was, there's a few drummers on that. So one, that was a great album. Yeah, that's a great album. Jerry Marotta's on Red Rain. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Jerry Stuart, Marotta. Stuart Copeland's on uh, yeah, Big Time. On, he's on Big Time as well. Yeah, so I got to know him through that. But he was on the. You know, you got to know drummers because you were you were always waiting every month for modern drummer. To yeah, come yeah. In. So they would, they, as I said, you know, as we know, it was like the Bible of of, of the drumming magazines and and you'd get to know drummers through that and then you, you'd go to the record store and you'd scour the, you know, the back and see who was on it and, you know, kind of go, oh, that, he's, that's right, yeah, and that album, you know, so he would really be an investigator as much as, a, you know, kind of. Oh, yeah, he, he, he became fascinating to me, that guy, because he's a, because I was, I, sorry? I was just going to say he's a very, you know, very accurate, sharp drummer. You know, very, oh, and he's so light. Yeah, he's he's a great player, yeah, and, he, and he does hi hats like Copeland. That's right. Yeah, and splash cymbals to get <laughs> like like, like wait, 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 wait. and and he can do these kind of because he's on he's on Sting, nothing like the Sun, Soul Cages. Well, um, I think Omar Hakim was a he. Omar Hakim's on Omar Hakim's on Dream of the Blue Turtles. That's right. Yeah, and that he's a monster. Like that that um. DVD yeah, he's killer too. Was, was fantastic. Yeah, I've got a. I mean, I've got a, a, a top five. You know, um, who are your top five drummers? Um, 
Well, Buddy Rich is definitely the, the, yeah, main, right. the, the main one. So, and Stuart Copeland would be there. Uh, Keith Moon would be there. Um, you would, you've got, um, you know, I really like Jimmy Chamberlain from the Smashy Pumpkins. I really, yeah, like right, him. yeah, as, yeah. As a, more, as a more contemporary recent player, I think he's fantastic. Yeah, he's really good. Really, really he's great. At, he's great at fills and making things liquid. He's very good at making things. Yeah, yeah. Well, well he's, he's got he's got real good dexterity and yeah, you know, great dexterity. Thing, thing and technique and stuff yeah. like that. Um, I mentioned Stuart Copeland, didn't I? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, Terry Bozio, I love Terry Bozio's playing. I think he's, you know, he's fantastic as well. I mean, there's just there's so many, and there's so many that have influenced me. Um, but I, I think I, I, and it's yeah, Buddy Rich spooks me for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I, I, it's he's channeling something else. I oh, know it's ludicrous. It's, it's like it's yeah. like watching a. It's like watching a you know well, well Clyde Burr's one of my favourite drummers. First Iron okay. Maiden drummer. Yeah, yeah. He always is. Because as we discussed on the phone the other day, he's, you know, it's a widdly, widdly band, Iron Maiden. They, they write widdly riffs. Widdly, 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 they're not chunky down the street. They're, they're widdly riffs. Yeah. And then they got they got finger, widdly bass playing. Yeah. And so Clive Bird, to me, in the first three records, he gave it, he gave it, Four four on the ground, solid. Plus his hi hat work at speeds is fantastic. His his fills up, and he, and his and his fills up, they snap your neck. Yeah, you know what I mean. They they, they come out yeah. they come out of the riff with the cymbal and they smash it and they and they keep it they keep it four on the floor while everybody else twiddlies around. But then they went and got then they went and got Nick A. McBrain who's twiddly. You know, okay. it's kind of jazzy. He's got a he's got a thin snare drum. He's kind of you know, and it's just to me now. Now the whole band's twiddly, right? And I'm like, no, no, yeah, no. So, that's not not quite right. Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, also Phil Collins is probably one of my he's amazing too. Yeah, because he's and that drum fill is probably the most recognised drum fill ever created. It, you know, in the edge da 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 da. You know, which is which is Phil? Uh, it's just great. and Genesis. You know, I love listening. To, to them, you know, well, great. Phil Collins, I didn't know was such a good drummer mm. until one, I started watching some old Genesis stuff, and two, just uh, he actually plays on an album with Manu Kashe because he plays the drums to the first track on Tears for Fears, Sowing the Seeds of Love, Woman oh, in Chains. Yeah, great song, great. great song, and that's Phil Collins drumming on that one. There you go, killer yeah. drumming. Oh yeah, he's great, and he's very uh, he's lefty, obviously, and yeah, you know, just he's he's very his drum kit's very much his own. You can see his setup is yeah, totally. He's really come from his you know, yeah, f great player, great f great. Player. Yeah, it's really actually quite sad to see him at the. I think he had a back operation, and that really messed him up. And yeah, totally. And and, and it's just yeah, for, I can't imagine what that would feel like not being able to pick up the sticks. You know, like no, he's a monster like, musician. And um, yeah, exactly. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, Hol yeah, holistically, a monster musician. Yeah, amazing. And who else yeah. I got into was uh, do you know Bob Seibenberg? Seibenberg. So he's from a uh, Super Tramp. Well, I remember listening to a lot of Super Tramp when I was younger, and I, I used to really dig the songs. And the oh, mate, they're unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, great, great songs. Unbelievable band. That drummer, he's American. They're all in English, but he's American. Yeah. Mate, he's just see. I like song drummers. I like the ones that, yeah, know how to. I like the guy from U two. He's a good song drummer. Yep. Uh, oh, you said listen. I, Mitch Mitchell was was really. Oh, he's cool. he's a, he's another one. On my radar. He's another on one of those radar. freaks that used to spin me out like Ian Pace from Deep Purple when I'd see Mitch yeah. Mitchell on those Jimi Hendrix clips, and I'm going, I'm never going to be able to do that. Yeah, like, I used to love his playing. Yeah, he's like. He used to listen to all. Listen he's like a, he's like a he's like a hippie buddy rich that buddy yeah yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> he is yeah I mean you, you start mentioning one and you can't mention that guy between Ginger Baker can't leave him out Art Blakey you know the Lenny White you know there's oh. just so many great Steve Gadd you know Vinnie Colaiuta oh Vinnie Colaiuta um, pretty, pretty you know Jeff Picaro you know oh there's Shane. another one I'm going to get shot for not mentioning all the great drummers you know I mean it's just but it's you know blessed to have you know, and I think for myself, I really had that um, want and ability and curiosity to listen to all types of drummers, you know, because it's all they're all playing rhythm, obviously different types. It doesn't matter the style or whatever. But I knew that I could learn 
something from all these players. Yeah, yeah. Was, and, and I was just, you know, obsessed, you know, my CDs. I got so much music, as we were saying before, you know, like before we got on, it was like the amount of money I invested in just buying <laughs> music, <laughs> you know, which so was like, like, which was like, the, you know, going down the rabbit hole of, of, of music. You Tell know, me about it. And, and if I'm going to understand it, well, I better get as much as I can and read as much as I can and know and listen as much as I can. So um, I get a good understanding of, of, you know, what I'm involved in, you know. So I think my brain kind of works like that. If I'm going to try to understand something or look at something, I get quite obsessive about it. And, oh, so do I. It's like really, when, I started, when yeah. I started comedy, I bought every book. Yeah. I'll read, I'll read, I'll read. So who is your, who's the, some of your favourite comics, even though I don't, you know, like tell me, because I've never asked you that question. Um. See, when I grew up, I got into comedy only because it was around. So it would have been the early stuff would be Billy Connolly. Yeah. Fine. See, I never wanted to be a comedian. I just like, who doesn't like laughing, right? So obviously <laughs> when I grow up, obviously when I grow up, I see Billy Connolly. I see Dave Allen. Remember Dave Allen? Okay. The Irish guy used to sit on the chair and drink whiskey and smoke cigarettes and have three fingers. He had two fingers missing or something. Right. This Irish guy he used to do skits about the Catholic Church in Ireland in the seventies, and he, he was on ABC here, and he used to tell a story at the end, and he could smoke, he drink whiskey and smoke on telly, right? Yeah, and he was he was he was amazing. And then in our teenage years, we're listening to we're listening to Slayer and Metallica, but we're listening to uh, Bill, Bill Cosby. Okay. Like we had a few Bill, my mate had a few Bill Cosby records, so we'd kind of listen to them. I remember listening to Exodus, Bonded by Blood, one day, and Bill Cosby records in the same day. And then, and then I wasn't, I wasn't interested in doing comedy. And then in the late eighties, we all had when comedy started to get big in the states. So we had Raw by Eddie Murphy, Sunset That's Strip so by funny. Sunset Strip by. Uh, oh. Yeah, no, I don't know what that was, and then. Uh, <laughs> it was. <laughs> By, by by who is God, I can't remember anybody's names. Fucking Richard Pryor, the king. Yes. And we had Steve Martin live in the LA. Oh, yeah. Steve was, that, yeah. That just being stupid. Just he's being stupid. Funny. He's, funny. he's a good Oh, he man. was just, he, he used to do stand up. Yeah, yeah. He used to do stand up, you know, and just stupid stand up, you know. Come out with an arrow between his head on his head and just, it's, but he wouldn't say anything for 20 minutes and then just go, have I had this thing on all the time? It was all just yeah. stupid, right? What about Derek and Clive? Did you? Did ah, you we had that? Derek and Clive as kids. Did you hear that album? Yeah, we totally that. have it. I, I could. It like I, I just remember the album cover. It was it was spew with false teeth. I could still. The, I, I, could st <laughs> I could still sing you the song. <laughs> oh my god, that was so funny. There was a song. All they like, would say is 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 you know, cunt. Yeah. Oh, it was out of control. You know. So that stuff was fantastic. Yeah. And then, as I said, in the eighties, we watched all these the the the, the raw and the yeah the raw was a, raw was a big one for you know for me growing up as a teenager. And then I got into listening to Jello Biafra and Henry Rollins. My punk mate showed me they had spoken word records, so I found that very intriguing that there was these guys that could get up there and just do spoken word. And, and then I no, it was a Jello Biafra from the Dead Kennedys and Henry. Oh, no, no, I'm saying, I'm saying, did you did you listen to much Hicks at all? Of course, I got into Bill Hicks. I'd started comedy because I was finally getting into my 30s, and I realised that I, I can't rely on bands anymore. Presto had broken up after five years of thousands of shows and two records and millions of rehearsals, and then it just breaks up. And you realise this is I'm at the mercy of other blokes now. And so I went and did. A, I went and did a. I, I, I thought I like comedy. I'm pretty funny. I went and did a, a, a intro intro uh, improvisation course, and thought I'll just learn to what it's like to go on stage without an instrument. And I was in the so weird. Oh, so, I was in the, it's so weird because the one thing about the drum kit is you're like behind something, <laughs> sneak like, in behind, <laughs> kind of hide. To some yeah. degree, you know, it's just it does. But yeah, like that must have been such a big transition for such you. Such a transition, and then it was like, then I was in Nazul at the time, which wasn't a touring band, just a recording band. And Lachlan, who is the keyboard player and the engineer, who's still an engineer, Lachlan Mitchell, you probably know. Yeah, I know he's a good. Yeah, he's a he's a friend of mine. We did an album called 
uh, tax. I was playing the bass on it and producing, and he was the engineer for it. Yeah, he's great. He did my yeah. Turnham album. Yeah, and I think we we named the album, which is this is good. We named it Thanks for the Shanks. You've got these two shanks at the back of your head, these two muscles. Yeah. And if you laugh really hard a lot, they start to hurt. These two muscles, are, you know, not only do you get the, like the, the chest kind of like, you know, rib kind of crunch because you're laughing so hard, but those two muscles at the back are the shanks. And we were just on that, we were recording that, and we were laughing and having such a great time. So we called the album Thanks for the Shanks. <laughs> <laughs> the taxi album, and um, yeah, yeah he's great. Really he's great. a great, he's a great guy, great engineer. Yeah, he's a great guy. I haven't seen him for I haven't seen him for years. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to try and get in contact with him. He uh, did my Eternum album. Yeah, right. And then the, the, the Nazul albums, and uh, his father had the VHS of Relentless by Bill Hicks. Ah, right. right. So one day we went round to his house in Newtown, his mother's house, and he's. He said, goes, have you ever seen this guy? And I went, no. He goes, oh, my old man, this is my old man. He just fucking learned it to me. Right. And I put it on him, wow. and, and that's when I went, that's Yeah, what. yeah, because there was something conscious going on with what Hicks was saying too, you know. Plus, because it was, uh, it was yeah, also like, it was killer material, killer yeah. jokes, but it was as hardcore as spoken word by Rollins and Biafra. Yep. You know what I mean, but it had everything. It had accents, the jokes, the structure, the 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 the, the, the passion, the intent, the full anger, the the no holes barred fucking chaos. And I just went right. This is fucking fed. This is this is like heavy metal and yes, and yeah. and punk yeah. into one thing. You know, this is yeah. this is why I like my music. I like my music like that says something. I like my I like artists that say something, be it politics or personal or whatever. But but you know. And so once I just saw that guy, no holes barred, I was like, I don't agree with everything Bill Hicks said anymore because yeah, some of his ideas were so lefty that I, I, I wouldn't, I would yeah, have, I would have I agreed with them then. I don't now. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, but he's well, he's, he's, he's still he's still one of my he's still like you know, if you want not fucking around. Yeah. Yeah. Also, the, also, the, also, the, Ken, the Ken, Ken, Kenison was around then too. Kenison and also. Uh, well, I didn't think it was that amazing, but he was great to watch. Sam Kinison. Okay, I don't know. No. Right, he was a, he was an American guy who used to be the who used to be a preacher. Okay, he grew up with an old man who was a who was a Christian preacher, and I think he became one. And then he just became a rock and roll maniac. He ended up dying in a car accident, getting into too many drugs, and and you know he was the kind of he, he could hang out with Motley Crue as much as he could hang out with comedians. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, right. so, so it was that era, and also of Andrew Dice Clay. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some funny things that he's like people have been sharing some because of the you know the, the political stupid correctness that's going on these days. There was a few Andrew Dice Clay things that come out. Like, I completely forgot about that guy, but when they came up, I was like, they were going through a bit of a feed on the on the, on the Instagrams, and I was like, that's that's right, that guy. And I was listening to it, and I'm going, man, that's just so great. He's just like out of the ballpark, you know? out of the ballpark. I mean, it's the one thing about Cog, you know, like like Luke. Yeah, I'd love you to spend some time. Well, all the gowers are just so funny, but Luke, I mean, my smile lines are because of my bass player. You know what I mean? Like he just he just makes me laugh like all the time. Um, and I think you guys would really connect and have a, have a great time. But um, in COG, it's, you know, even though the world's heavy and it's weighted and there's a lot of shit going on and, you know, we've got to somehow navigate through all that stuff. Within the band, it's just the, the amount of laughs and fun that we have it's just it's just so it's so healthy you know and it, and it's 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 so infectious you know and, and I was, i'm really blessed to be with those two you know like, well we're, we're going to finish up so com comedy us. is such a big big part of the band you know having a laugh oh. at the world at the same time as it's going mad you know? <laughs> it's like, mate i've been in bands and i've been a comedian and i am a comedian so i've realized that a lot of a lot of guys in bands are quite stupidly funny and would love to do comedy, and a lot of guys who are comedians would love to be in a band so they could be serious and stand in an alleyway and go. <laughs> get the photo too. I don't know if yeah. you've seen that that one photo. It's a meme. It's pretty pretty funny. You know, it's, a, it's supposed to be a kind of metal band. The, the, the guy in the back's the drummer, and he's he's just like he's just got that kind of laughing <laughs> face. But the rest of the band's just like, like <laughs> that fucking face on, like he's tough and he's heaps serious. That's the kind of that's the kind of photo where someone from the record company, if they picked it, they picked that one. Yeah, why, 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 why'd you pick this one? 
There's a cover yeah. of the, the one mortal suit CD I put out there, which is just a single, which I did because I'm on the live side. But the photo chosen for the cover is like, who, who at the record company did you let pick this fucker? There's hair blown <laughs> across the guitarist's face. Someone's got their eyes going. You're like, what? Well, that's it. Well, that's why I like I love Zappa because Frank Zappa, you know, it was comedy running through the whole thing. Plus, yeah, yeah, really, yeah. Plus, plus, it was really politically motivated. I was never know? good. I was never good at mixing my comedy with my music, though. I, I like oh. I like a serious mess. Up. That's why I liked early U two before we realized Bono was a full blown fucking globalist. <laughs> was it was a lot of people who didn't like U two because it's too it's too serious and messianic. Yeah, I like. Serious and messianic. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I always have. I'm like, because if you can pull off being serious and messianic, it's that's a rare one to pull off. Yeah, yeah. Complete <laughs> dick, right? So, so, so I like that one. Yeah. Anyway, so, right. so, so we're going to finish up. So tell us about what Cog's doing now. You, you, you got a tour? Uh, for- yeah, yeah. We, we do have a tour actually in March. We, we just, um, you know, for our two albums, the new normal and sharing space. Um, we got our rights back um, after 15 years. Um, January 2023, we got our rights back. So we've finally made some vinyl, you know, which is which is something I guess that we've always wanted to do. Um, we grew up with vinyl, so there's a, a real tangible thing about it, you know, a relationship about it. And we just wanted to kind of like, you know, do a tour. And uh, what's that one? Oh, right. Oh, no way. Fantastic. I have to get one of those. All right, I'll bring you one up when I come up to I want to record yeah. some more tracks. So I'll come up there. Yeah, I haven't even got this on CD yet. I haven't understand. heard I haven't even heard the bastard because I haven't got it right. Yeah, it's like when you see the vinyl, you just go, oh, you, you get shivers up your spine. Yeah, it's <laughs> much like, better. It's vinyl, you know. Much better. I mean, we're yeah, saving your pennies, getting on that bus, going into town, spending hours going through the, you know, it was like a relationship building exercise right. with the band and the music and it gave it value you know gave it and, value, man. and now it's just you know so it's just yeah whatever but um yeah so we got this tour and that's in march and we're doing all the major cities in australia um five <laughs> five or six five shows <laughs> huge huge we're gonna, we're gonna have to take a couple of months off after this you know it's not like iron maiden live albums in the 80s oh, the- see there oh, no. goes my there goes my ribs. Start, <laughs> oh, my shanks are coming up. Remember the albums, the Iron Maiden albums in the eighties would would, would would tell you on the live albums, and and how many gigs did we do? Two hundred and ninety-seven. Yeah, I look, some of the, look at those dates that those guys do over there, and I just go, fucking so. Well, not I'm not only am I jealous, but I'm just going like, how do they do it? That's just like incredible. <laughs> it's like, no, it's, there's just know. so many places to play. You know, it's like here, it's like okay. Well, that's a set. You know, back in the day, it was like, well, let's before we were anything, we'd drive like ten hours, you know, like and get there, and you just play to the bar stuff, you know? mate. Mate, we've all right. <laughs> not, not, of- not only that, they would they would like hate you, and then you know they'd have a particular like one particular moment. You know, we played this gig, and this this chick behind the bars got this petition, and she's gone round to the like people that were in the venue and got them to sign it. And said so, Cog would never come back and play there, and. She went up to Luke and Luke tells the story. Yeah, I signed it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. We're not but, coming yeah. back. All right. So that's around it's so, well That's March, yeah. It's twenty yeah, March basically. It's funny, I was listening to an interview with Ray from the excuse me, Ray from the Hard Ons, and he was going, you know, if you can't handle it in Australia, like don't join a band, because if you can't handle that it, it was good. He was he was turning the negatives into a positive. Which I liked about his, his his attitude towards it was like you know oh, yeah, it's, it's you, you you've got to be hardcore you know to, to to do this in Australia to be in a band to get this to get nothing to, will, you, will you drive the ten hours he goes once we were doing like the thirtieth anniversary tour and we got to a venue half an hour late and then they wouldn't let us set up our merch because we were half an hour late he's like this is the respect I'm getting after thirty yeah, yeah, years yeah. yeah I know right. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's I mean, well, you know, if, if what it I play hard about Australia. If it was country, easy, it's a country that seems to want to make you not succeed, or 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 it can never show you respect. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, 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 it's got a feeling. Of, well, you know, why? Well, who do you think you are, mate? Well, I'm the guy who's been in the hard ons for thirty years. Yeah, 
Show him some respect. Don't yeah. not let him sell his T-shirts because he got there half an hour late after the 10-hour drive. <laughs> yeah, well, now it's like this is, this is my little episode the other night. I play in a lot of, you know, community cover bands around here, which is great for my playing, great players, um, all really, really blessed to play with them. Um, and I'm playing this gig. Um, I won't name the venue, but, I mean, a lot of venues are kind of starting, well, not starting, they've been kind of, you know, going this way for, for a little bit of time. So I don't really drink alcohol, right? So anyway, I've, I've done this set and I'm thirsty and it's just, we got a rider, which was nice, and it's just got the beer in the rider. And I went to the bar and, I, I you know, I want just a soda water or a coconut. I said, can I get a coconut water, you know, like one of those, please? And the lady's gone. She's going, she's going well, you've got a rider and, and already it's been given to the band. And I went, I went, yeah, but I, I don't really drink and I just like the coconut water. That's all right. You know, got three more sets to play. Um, <laughs> you know, it'd be nice. And, she, and she's like, oh, well, I'm going to have to charge you. And I'm like, so I was, I'm like, well, what happens if I go and get one of the beers that were in the rider and I bring it back to you and I exchange it out for the coconut water? Is that going to be okay? You know, and she's like, yeah, that'll work. Yeah, that'll work. I'm like, you know. God, you know, so I go back, I grab the beer, come back, I go, here you go, here's the beer. And she looked at me and she, she kind of, the penny dropped, right? And she's gone, oh, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> and I was like, you know, back in the, back in the day, you know, you, 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 you would get treated, you know, with a certain amount of respect, you know, from, from some of the publicans and, you know, and you would get a bit of a rider and, you know, you get all you the, know, you know, percentage off the meals or you get a, and it's like, you know, it's like, are you serious? Like, <laughs> so it's getting harder, Steve. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, we're going to end up. So we won't, we won't end up by bitching about coconut water. We'll end, yeah. up, we'll, we'll, we'll end up with your date. So, again, they're in March. Have you got the date? So if people want uh, to see. No, I don't have the dates, but the website is um, cog.com.au. Sign up to the newsletter, please, um, you know, and subscribe. And, we, you know, we've got all the information on the we got the, the Facebooks and the Instagrams, yeah. but, you know, the, the home base, um, HQ. Um, come out, folks. Come out. Yeah, like get off get off the couch. Get off the couch. Come out. See Stop some scrolling. Hardcore. Stop scrolling. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll even get you free coconut water. You yeah, know? That, well, that was, that was like, you know, when the whole pandemic was going down. It was like, well, now you can just, like, set up and, like, play, you know, and film it and play to the world while you're in lockdown. And I'm like. I'm like fuck that. Like I, you know, like I didn't spend ten years in the in the fucking bunker practicing to stay in here. It's like, <laughs> I wanna, you know, like I want to get out in the live environment where that's where the real energy is. That's where the relationship is. That's where the connection is. You know, I'm not gonna do that. But as we were talking about before, the, the nature of things is unimportant anymore. Hundred percent. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we get. We, we can get into it. Let's do this again. We can, just, we can yeah, discuss love, drums love and love conspiracy. It. Yeah, well, yeah. This is this is good. This we we did this before, folks. We did a we did this interview before, but we were getting interference from the new world order and the in the connection. That's why that's why we used to, well, like to view it anyway. Yeah, you know, <laughs> that's right. And, yeah, that's so, right. So I no, think it, it wasn't it wasn't my studio that's built in a certain way that was just cutting out the frequency. No, it wasn't that. The, it was the secret. It was the secret government. But, but 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 the plan is, if anything goes down like that, if you just if you want to get off the matrix and the radar and the you know surveillance, just come in here and close the door and you vanish because it's just the way it's made. You, oh, it just doesn't. You don't get any connection. I can take. But it's I, brilliant. I, I can take me me tin foil Parker off. <laughs> 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 oh my shanks oh, my All right. my well shanks. we're going to end it up so thanks very much for coming along that was good fun thanks dude oh, my no, day's better my day's better alright and you'll see me soon you're going to come up there I've got two tracks demoed already we're going to come up and record them yeah let's do it beautiful alright alright brother have a good day you see too. you later folks Lucius Borch Du 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 du